Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, travel, and advocacy. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Indiana lawmakers failed this week to advance a bill that would have established a hate crimes law. The measure had bipartisan support. So what happened to cause its demise again this year? Proposed legislation would open the door for logging on private land. It's a debate about property rights and protecting natural resources. But conflict of interest is also coming into play. Right off the bat, I would say in the first year, you're talking thousands of jobs that will be created from this bill alone. Craft breweries have long enjoyed exclusive rights to sell carry out alcohol on Sundays. But a measure advancing at the State House could expand sales to liquor and convenience stores. Ahead, how craft breweries are preparing for the potential impact. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Indiana will remain one of five states without a hate crimes law after the Senate Republican Caucus opted not to take a vote on the bill this session. The hate crimes bill would have allowed a judge to impose harsher penalties if the crime was committed in part because of a victim's characteristics. One of those characteristics was gender identity, which bill author Republican Senator Sue Glick says was a significant sticking point. I really believe that many people read that list and see in parens, in their minds, it only applies to this race or this religion or these people. A Senate committee didn't vote on the bill, which Senate GOP leader David Long says was a decision of his caucus. Still, he says he'll push for the bill to come back next year and notes some issues take years to reach the finish line. Hate crimes legislation has been proposed and failed for decades. Indiana Senator Greg Taylor joins us from the State House. Senator, thank you so much for being here today. Now, this wasn't your bill, but you've authored hate crimes legislation multiple times. It really seemed like this year the issue had momentum. What happened? Well, I, uh, as you said earlier, it, I thought the bill had momentum. I thought that what had happened nationally was going to induce us to make some changes here in Indiana. Unfortunately, what happened uh, was the supermajority decided it was not something that uh, they would be willing to bring to the floor for debate. And uh, that's what happens when you have uh, one group in charge so much that they don't really need us to go to the floor. So. They decided uh, amongst themselves in their caucus that they wouldn't hear the bill. So what happens now? Will lawmakers study who should be part of a protected class? And then is it possible we'll see another bill again next year? I think it's possible to see another bill next year. Uh, I've filed uh, the same bill for approximately the last six legislative sessions and have yet to uh, have my bill get a hearing. Um, I was very optimistic when I heard from uh, the majority side of the aisle that they had two individuals uh, who were filing bills and uh, I thought that was going to move things forward. Um, unfortunately, again, it was not even open for debate and didn't even make it to the floor to have discussions. Typically in these situations, we at least give a bill an opportunity to go to the floor uh, you might even hear us in caucus talking about voting for a bill that we know is going to change when it gets to the Senate floor. Unfortunately, I think that there are a lot of people uh, who want to hide from this issue and uh, were able to do so because the bill never made it to the floor of the Indiana Senate. 
So one more question. We've reported a lot that you know, Indiana is one of five states that doesn't have a hate crimes law. You know, along that comes with questions about how outsiders perceive Indiana. Do we look backwards? And could it hurt the, the economy? So how do we track those things? Is the, is the lack of a hate crimes law having a negative impact on the state? Um, just like RIFRA we saw a few years ago, I think that you can look and talk to the economic develop, development officials across the state and they can be very clear about the fact that people are watching, they're watching what we do here in Indiana. Indiana being one of those states with the be, one of the best costs of living in the country, we should be open to a lot of people. Unfortunately, the uh, younger generation see our, uh, what I call archaic laws and uh, don't want to live here. And that's unfortunate for those of us who want to see Indiana grow and become a, a powerhouse for uh, the new tech uh, expansions that we see across the country. Sure. And quite frankly, we made it in the city of Indianapolis and the surrounding areas made it into the top 20 for Amazon. And I think they're going to have a, a lot to say about what happened in the General Assembly this year. And uh, right. unfortunately for some of the citizens of Indiana, we I think we hurt ourselves in trying to uh, entice a company like that to come to Indiana. Okay, Senator, thank you so much. Thank you. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. A consultant group hired to look into Indiana's Department of Child Services says it's already identified issues at the agency, including an ineffective data system and high numbers of children in the DCS system in out-of-home care. Please note that CWG uh, consultants are national experts on child welfare, uh, but they are just getting started. Um, so today's conversation and the progress report will set out the scope of work, the types of data the child welfare group will seek and evaluate. Now, controversy at DCS erupted with former director Mary Beth Bonaventuro's resignation letter, which raised significant issues with the agency. The state ordered an independent evaluation. This week was the one month, pro one month progress report. Over the coming months, the consultants plan to interview stakeholders, shadow employees, and review all of DCS's internal policies and procedures. The consultants won't say whether they'll interview the former director of the agency. The group's final report is expected in June. The state is once again telling Terre Haute to reduce its spending. This marks the second year the city has gotten the notice. Terre Haute submitted its proposed budget to the Department of Local Government Finance, and the department found that revenue won't meet expenditures. The order tells the city it needs to cut about two and a half million dollars from its budget. Last year, the amount was eight and a half million. The city has until February 5th to respond to the state. Parolees released to Monroe County will now have to be from the area or have relatives living there. Bloomington Police Chief Mike Decoff says he received a commitment from Department of Correction officials that they would more closely watch parolees and where they choose to be dropped off. If the person was not from Monroe County or did not have some kind of ties to Monroe County, they would prohibit them from choosing Monroe County to be released to. Decoff says people often choose to be released in the county because of social services that are available. The House could vote Monday on a bill that forces townships with fewer than 1,200 people to consolidate with an adjacent unit. Now, attempts to amend the bill to give townships a choice about whether to consolidate failed this week. Cannabidiol, or CBD, would become illegal for all Hoosiers under legislation unanimously approved this week in the House. The measure defines CBD as a byproduct of the cannabis plant that contains no more than 0.3% THC, a psychoactive ingredient, and it legalizes CBD. The bill now goes to the Senate. A bill that would have raised the state's minimum smoking age to 21 is dead. It unanimously passed through the Public Health Committee, but House Speaker Brian Bosma says it also needed to go through the Ways and Means Committee since it would have a fiscal impact. The deadline for committees to hear bills is already passed, so the smoking bill can't advance this session. A Senate committee proposal would let some new teachers get their licenses without having to pass a content exam. The idea isn't without critics, but the state's 
superintendent maintains it could help ease the teacher shortage. The legislation says the state can license teachers if they have tried and failed a content exam at least twice. But those teachers would still need to have a B average in their teacher prep courses. As Indiana lawmakers inch closer to allowing Sunday alcohol sales, some brewery owners who've enjoyed, who've enjoyed exclusive rights say the bill likely won't have much of an impact on their sales. Currently, microbreweries can sell alcohol to go on Sundays, which attracts customers in a state without Sunday liquor sales. But at least one southern Indiana brewery is unfazed by Sunday sales. Bloomington Brewing Company head brewer Nick Banks says he predicts that the new laws will be more of a benefit. So I'd say any, um, any sales that have been taken away by the fact that you can go anywhere now um, shouldn't be a problem because we are increasing our inventory and in grocery stores, liquor stores. It should be a really positive thing. Banks says he welcomes the prospect of more clarity about Indiana's liquor laws, which could mean more customers. So this new law might bring to light the fact that uh, people can come to our brew pub on Sunday, um, get growlers, get cans, bottles, and carry them out. Brewers will have to wait for grosser cold beer sales as that failed to get approval this year. One of the chamber's identical bills will have to pass through its opposite house before the measure can go to the governor's desk. Federal and state officials have until the end of the month to finalize details of how Indiana's Medicaid program works. The Healthy Indiana plan was set to expire at the end of January, but the federal government gave the state an extension until February 28th. Indiana wants to require many Medicaid recipients to work, attend school, or get job training to receive benefits. The federal government is still considering whether to approve those changes. The recent spike in flu activity is leading to an increase in telehealth visits for some health care providers. The virtual appointments reduce the risk of exposure for patients and physicians. Franciscan Health in Indianapolis says this year's aggressive flu is causing major problems for patients with existing medical conditions. Since we are uh, increasing the number of patients that have medical conditions, primarily heart and lung disease. Our telehealth also utilization has increased um, probably about 20 to 30 patients. State lawmakers passed a bill in 2016 that allows doctors to conduct exams through video conference and even give prescriptions. She says overall admissions to the hospital are up as well. The Indiana State Department of Health says 136 people have died from the flu so far this season. As the I-69 corridor creeps further north, Martinsville city leaders are preparing for interstate construction. Martinsville Mayor Shannon Cole says they are applying for road grants to better connect city streets near the new interstate. The city is also helping find new locations for displaced businesses. We're kind of in that lull where we know it's going to happen and we're waiting for this, but once this comes, boom, 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 we're just going to get everybody where they need to be. Cole says she expects workers to be moving dirt in 2019 if Section 5 of I-69 through Bloomington wraps up in August. The funeral for an Indiana soldier who died in a helicopter crash is tomorrow in his hometown of Bicknell. First Lieutenant, Lieutenant Clayton Colin is one of two soldiers who was killed when a helicopter crashed during training in California. Colin graduated from Indiana University's Army ROTC program in 2015. Congressman Andre Carson wants to recognize the site in Indianapolis where Robert Kennedy gave a speech the night Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. The legislation Carson is proposing would establish the Kennedy King Park as a national historic site. Kennedy's team tried to get him to cancel his appearance at the park following King's assassination, but he didn't and instead gave a speech Many say kept the city peaceful while protests erupted across the country. Joe, that's certainly a bill we'll be keeping our eyes on to see if it moves anywhere. Certainly. Thank you very much, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Local governments could lose the power to regulate timber harvest on private lands while some worry about the environmental impacts. Others say loosening the regulations could create jobs. Barbara will be back with us for that story. 
An Indiana University grad says his new film on hazing while fiction is based on his college experience at IU. Ahead, we talked to the director during a screening of the film This Week in Bloomington. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. A Republican lawmaker says a bill that would stop local governments from regulating logging and mineral extraction on private property could create thousands of jobs. But some Monroe County leaders say it would limit their ability to protect valuable resources like limestone and the local water supply. As Barbara Brozier reports, it has people debating whether individual property rights and protecting natural resources are mutually exclusive. As you drive down the road surrounding Lake Monroe, you'll occasionally come across a few houses or mailboxes. But what strikes you are the seemingly endless trees. It's one of the things that draws people to this part of the state. One of Joe's dreams in, in, with this particular piece of property is that he wants to uh, eventually build some home sites. That's not the immediate goal, but eventually he'd like to build a home site out there for him and his family. Thomas Malapit is an attorney who represents Joe Huff, an Indiana businessman who hopes to eventually build a home on the property he owns along Lake Monroe. Huff submitted a permit to log on a portion of that land last year, but withdrew the request after Malapit says Monroe County officials indicated their resistance, but he could move forward without their approval if a proposal passes at the State House. As I see it, this bill is really a, a right for people to take care of their own land. Republican Representative Jeff Ellington laid out the specifics of his bill at a committee hearing this week. Among other things, it would stop all levels of local governments from regulating timber harvests or mineral extraction on private land. For me, this is a bill about jobs. Jobs not only for my local community, but throughout the state of Indiana. It would essentially allow individuals or companies to log or extract minerals like limestone on any private property, regardless of how it's zoned. Ellington says the bill would also make it easier for private landowners to adopt their own forestry and insect control practices, which could help prevent the spread of disease. But the director of Monroe County's planning department is alarmed by the idea. We have a lot of concerns on this, how it would impact the industry locally. Monroe County has nearly 6,500 acres designated solely for extracting limestone and other minerals. People can't build houses or businesses in those areas. This creates a buffer for mineral extraction activity. It preserves the limestone resources for the long term and also alerts homeowners that, hey, if you're moving next to this mineral extraction zone, there may be activities that will bother you. Wilson says the county's current logging regulations also help protect Lake Monroe from erosion and practices that could hurt the water quality. The lake serves as the drinking water supply for the area. Wilson thinks it's important to talk about timber and minerals, but he wants to see the issue studied. We ought to look about how we manage these resources, and that's not to say we can't use the resources, but that they be managed and that they be done in a way that do not cause adverse impacts either to the public resources or to adjacent private property owners. But the bill passed out of committee this week and has the support of several powerful organizations, including the Indiana Builders Association, Indiana Farm Bureau, and the Forestry and Woodland Owners Association. Malapit says while the focus of the debate is on Monroe County, the change would impact Hoosiers all over the state. He sees it as an opportunity for them to do what they want with what they already own.
I can't imagine a government stepping in and I have my own land and I discover that I've got some sort of mineral rights on that particular property and then local government try to step in and try to regulate what I can do with those, those local mineral rights. Reporter Barbara Brozier joins us now for a little bit more. Barbara, there's been some question about who can benefit from this bill, though. Uh, that's right, Joe. So Ellington, who has authored this bill, he actually owns a tree service company here in Monroe County, which some people might say, hey, couldn't that be a conflict of interest? Um, now, he lists this on a statement every year. Lawmakers have to fill out a paper that says what their economic interests are. So he discloses that. Here's what Ellington had to say when I asked him about this potential conflict. You know, I own a tree service, I own a demolition company, I've had horse stables. Uh, I started out uh, in saving people's trees and that's what I continue to do through disease and pest management. Those are residential customers. I don't do any forestry production or timbering. Never have, never will. So Ellington says his business would not profit from this bill, but Joe, I did talk to an ethics expert at IPFW up in Fort Wayne, and he says speaking more generally, just because lawmakers can propose bills like this that they could potentially benefit from, it doesn't mean it's always ethical. Here's, here's his take. So if you have a legislator who either uh, writes up, who drafts, who discusses and debates, who votes on legislation, that is in works in his personal interest, then the concern is, is that his judgment isn't about his constituents' interest, isn't fulfilling the responsibilities that he has to his constituents, but instead is a judgment that focuses on what's good for him. So that comment, not specific to the Ellington situation, but it does just raise some more broad, broad questions about ethics when it comes to legislators. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any other amendments being discussed? Uh, well, one big change is that uh, this bill would go into effect immediately upon it passing um, instead of in July. And then also this could also prohibit people from regulating mining as well. All right. Thank you very much, Barbara. A film directed by an Indiana University alum tackles the dark side of Greek life. As Sophia Salabi reports, fraternity members discuss the controversial tradition of hazing and its place in Greek life during a screening on campus. The movie Hayes is fictional, but director and IU alum David Berkman says he based it on his own personal experience in Greek life as an undergrad at the university. The film is centered around the aftermath of a death caused by fraternity hazing and two brothers caught up on opposite sides of the issue. Welcome to hell. Several IU fraternities and Indian Hillel, a Jewish campus organization, sponsored the screening and visit by Berkman. The university is no stranger to hazing controversies. In 2011, a former member of Phi Sigma Kappa died after being found unresponsive in the fraternity's on-campus house. Since then, four fraternities have been suspended due to violations relating to hazing and alcohol. Make no mistake about it, this is not going to be easy. There's some people in this frat that are going to make it as hard as possible. According to data gathered by Franklin College professor Hank Neuer, four students died in hazing-related incidents across the country in 2017. Berkman says his film is about opening a dialogue about hazing. The hope is, is that people will watch the film and start to talk more openly and honestly with each other uh, about uh, the problem of hazing, which is uh, very, um, it's a really growing problem in this country. The university's inner fraternity council voted to suspend all social activities through the end of February last November as part of a growing national movement in response to hazing incidents. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. Connor Prairie experienced its highest ever attendance rate last year, up by more than 37,000 people from 2016. Officials are exploring ways to continue the outdoor, the outdoor museum's growth through a 20-year site master plan, which they launched in 2017. The organization owns more than 1,000 acres of land, but only uses about 60 acres for programs and exhibits. We currently are doing nothing on the west side of our property, which is the, the river road side of the property. So if we wanted to expand and, and have programs on that side, what would that look like? How would we get people there, both from transportation and perhaps bridges over the White River so we can actually connect both sides? Connor Prairie launched a new indoor exhibit last month called the Makesmith Workshop. It helps kids learn skills like woodworking and sewing. The organization also plans to open a new outdoor experience in March called Fort Hoosier, which promotes free play in nature. 
Well, Indiana is one step closer toward getting an official state insect. Lawmakers are considering a measure that would make the Says firefly the official state insect. A committee unanimously approved the bill this week, sending it to the full Senate. Entomologist Thomas Say named the insect in 1826 while living in New Harmony, Indiana. And this week's lunar trifecta was the first since the 1980s. And Hoosiers got a great view. Now, if you missed it, take a look at this. These NASA images show the super blue blood moon total lunar eclipse. Researchers gathered lots of data, particularly about what happens when the moon's surface temperature drops quickly. NASA says that information will have practical uses, such as helping to determine suitable landing sites. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Now we leave you with more images from this week's lunar events. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, travel, and advocacy. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.